Good morning, friends. Stand with us, and we'll begin worshiping today. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, He parted the raging sea, my God, He holds a victory, yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. Oh, 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 we shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from the grave, my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. And we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. And we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh. We shout out your praise, oh, oh. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope and no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my and heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my fear rose to dance. 
when death was arrested my life began oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you release from my chains i'm a prisoner my shame was a ransom he fearfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. Be new now, life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now, life begins with you. Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you of all the redeemed yes we're free free forever amen when death was arrested and my life began oh we're free free forever we're free come join the song of all the redeemed yes we're free free forever amen when death was arrested and my And my life began when death was arrested, and my life began. Good morning. My name is Peter Sprigg. I am one of the elders here at Green Ridge, and uh, it's now going to be my privilege to lead you in the Lord's Prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer because when Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray, this is the prayer he taught them. Now, it's not the only way we can pray, but because this appears in Scripture, when we pray this together, we pray not only with each other, but with all, we do something in common with all of the Christians who have lived for the last 2,000 years and have prayed this prayer. Now, we want, you may have learned this as a child. Feel free to say it however you learned it. 
uh, uh, growing up, including even in a different language, if you speak a different language. But we will have a, um, a, a one version of it on the screen, and I'm going to be uh, repeating that version. Okay, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Good morning. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at Green Ridge. At Green Ridge, we are uh, exiles, exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus. That's who we hope to be. <laughs> Eric is running around this morning. Um, uh, I have several announcements that I want to let you know about. If my, yeah. Um, several announcements I want to let you know about. One of them is that the extravaganza happened yesterday. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the volunteers. Please clap for them. Thank you so much for doing that. Friends, we had new faces yesterday. There were people here that I'd never met before, and we were able to minister to them. And they were able to hear the gospel presentation that Mark did. It was great. It was fun. It was awesome. Um, so praise God for that. If you see any new faces, they may be from the extravaganza, and so be sure to welcome them and uh, make them feel loved today. Uh, the cinnamon roll numbers, What do you have a number for me on that one? They were great. They went well. Thank you so much to uh, the Browns and the Luthers for heading that up. They were the ones that uh, kind of organized it and did all of that stuff. Uh, friends, I want to make sure that you know about, you should have seen this in the Thursday email that was sent out, um, but there is a big celebration for Pastor Tim on June 4th. Um, his last Sunday as one of the pastors here at Green Ridge is going to be June 5th. And so we are going to have a big celebration for him on June 4th, Saturday that night. And so we want to be sure that you know about that because you need to register for it if you're going to come. If you didn't see that email or you don't know how to do that or whatever, please contact the office and we'll help you uh, get registered for that. Big things this week. This is Palm Sunday, and so this is the beginning of Holy Week. We've got some weird stuff going on this week, weird in a good way, not in a bad way. There's no Wednesday night programming this week, okay? No Wednesday night programming, no Wednesday night dinner. Don't, don't come on Wednesday because no one will be here, okay? Uh, we will have a Maundy Thursday service this year, and that will be at 6 p.m. Um, it will be in the sanctuary, so please uh, come for that. It will be a good time for us to fellowship and, and remember what uh, Jesus and the disciples were doing on that Thursday before Good Friday. Easter, next Sunday, is a one-hour service at 10 o'clock, all right? One-hour service next week at 10 o'clock so that you can go and have Easter lunch with family. Uh, next week, also, we are going to take up our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Um, be sure to, if you've been praying about that, thinking through that, be sure to bring that with you. Um, let me check my paper. It's been quite a morning. I need to see what's next. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, 6 p.m. Yes. Lots of people called out sick today, so I have to refresh my memory. Stand with me, and we're going to continue worshiping today. Let me pray for us. Holy Father, we are thankful that you love us and that you have served us so well in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that um, for the rest of our time this morning, that you would be exalted and magnified and glorified by what we do. God, we want the only thing that happens here to be your exaltation. God, we don't want to uh, hold any of the accolades or adoration for ourselves. We want to give it all to you, reflect it all back to you. God, I pray that, that you would help us to do that today. I also pray, God, that in your mercy, by your grace, that you would build us up through the songs that we sing, through the message that we hear and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing our God 
and firm foundation. Our God and a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus, you are the only king forever, almighty God we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign. Every knee will bow. We bring our expectations our hope is anchored in your name the name of Jesus we trust the name of Jesus you are the only king forever almighty God we lift you higher you are the only king forever forevermore you are victorious you are the only king forever almighty god we lift you higher you are the only king forever forevermore you are victorious high we lift the name of jesus from age to age you reign your kingdom has no end we lift our banner high we lift the name of jesus from age to age you reign your kingdom has no end you are the only king forever Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days oh yes i will I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting 
The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. So oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Matthew 21, 6 through 11. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkeys and the coat and put them on them, their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went before him and followed and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And, and the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from, 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 Nazareth, from Nazareth of Galilee. Is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, eyes are yearning for you. We long for you. When we see you, we find strength to face a day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, hear the sound of hearts returning to you we turn to you in your kingdom broken lives are made new you make us new cause when we see 
KPW kids, you are dismissed to leave today. Congregation, you can go ahead and have a seat. We're going to pray for, uh, Carrie's going to lead us in uh, scripture first, and then we're going to pray for our kids uh, and for our offering. Go ahead, Carrie. Let's go ahead and do the congregational reading, Susanna. All right, let me pray for them first, and then we'll get that sorted out. Uh, We're going to pray for our kids, we're going to pray for the offering, and we're going to pray for um, uh, the special music after Carrie reads for us. Let's pray together. God, we are thankful for... uh, the coming of Jesus. Palm Sunday is uh, his triumphal entry when he he comes as a king. And Father, we celebrate the kingship of Jesus today. And we pray, Father, that um, his kingship, his salvation, his grace, his death, his resurrection, we pray that all of that is communicated uh, beautifully to our kids today. We pray that their hearts are open to receive that message. We pray that, uh, that the uh, workers who are working with them would be blessed today to speak in a way that is uh, clear and meaningful so that our kids leave here today knowing Jesus better. We pray for parents and grandparents and caregivers and aunts and uncles and everybody who is able to speak into the lives of these kids that you would bless us with the ability to disciple them well and to lead them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'm Carrie Tobin. Let's read God's word together. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross.
Father, we pray for Pastor Eric as he brings the message this morning. We pray that, God, you would calm our hearts to receive your word, that your word would be declared and proclaimed with clarity. God, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to receive what you have to say to us today. Father, we pray that you would bless your servant and that you would bless us through what he brings this morning. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, a couple things before we get started. Um, it's been a weird week for me personally, and it's been a weird morning for us church-wise. Um, I know we've had a couple of issues here and there, but we're going to worship the Lord in spirit and truth no matter what happens up here. Is that right? All right. That's cool. Uh, real quick, would you join me in thanking God for Pastor Paul and Miss Elizabeth? Uh, Pastor Paul's had a really weird morning with people calling out sick. Um, Miss Elizabeth, like, absolutely nailed it with the Easter extravaganza. If you weren't here yesterday, you missed out on a party. It was awesome. And this, this up here... This was adorable. I don't know about y'all. I loved it. I was a very proud daddy for a few minutes there. Um, and just for me personally, it's a huge gift. I don't know how many of you get to do this, but it's a huge gift for me to be able to show up to here throughout the week and serve with people who love God, love others, and are my friends. Awesome, awesome people. Very excited. I will now reveal to you all of their flaws. No, just kidding. Um, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it to John chapter 12. We're going to be in John chapter 12 today. Uh, alternatively, you could go to any of the other Gospels. But let's go to John chapter 12 together. Uh, we're going to be in verses 12 to 19. John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. God's Word says this, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him since when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that we are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word that teaches us, instructs us, moves in our hearts. I pray, God, that you would be here. I pray that this would be a sermon that would glorify you and not me. I pray that this would be about you and not a pastor, but about the eternal God who speaks truth into our lives. God, be with us. Be with me. Help calm my nerves. May we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. The time had come at last when Christ was to die for the sins of the world. The time had come when the true Passover lamb was to be slain, when the true blood of atonement was to be shed, when Messiah was to be cut off, according to prophecy, Daniel 9.26, when the way into the holiest was to be opened by the true high priest to all mankind. Knowing all this, our Lord purposely drew attention to himself. Knowing this, he placed himself prominently under the notice of the whole Jewish nation. It was only fit and right that this thing should not be done, quote, in a corner, Acts 26, 26. If ever there was a transaction in our Lord's earthly ministry which was public, it was the sacrifice which he offered up on the cross of Calvary. He died at the time of year when all the tribes were assembled at Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Nor was this all. He died in a week when, by his remarkable public entry into Jerusalem, he had caused the eyes of all Israel to be specially fixed upon himself. Happy Palm Sunday, everyone. 
if you're not familiar with what in the world Palm Sunday is and why there are tree leaves on the floor up here, uh, Palm Sunday, uh, in this particular week leading up to Easter Sunday, we celebrate um, Easter as the single most important event in human history. Not just in a religion, but in all human history, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead is the most important thing of all time. Palm Sunday, which we celebrate today, is a day where we remember and we recreate the waving of palm branches as the people of Jerusalem did in the story that's recorded actually in all four gospel accounts in the New Testament. Now, the week between this Sunday and next Sunday, East, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, is commonly referred to as Holy Week. Uh, for a long time, Holy Week has been thought of as the most important week of the year for those who follow Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, who are in Christ here this morning and online, I want to start off with this question. Is this coming week in your minds and your hearts the most important week of your year? And if it's not, how come? As I'm preparing this sermon over the week and reading over it, praying over it, I happened to run across this article that was written by a professor at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary uh, that encouraged its readers to look at this story that we just read in kind of a new light. And apparently that's a theme for me as I preach four times a year here. Uh, so we're going to look at this a little bit differently than we have before. We're going to actually look at this New Testament story through a lens of an Old Testament story, a, a little bit more obscure one, but we're going to call that the first triumphal entry. So we're going to rewind the clocks a little bit, about 900 years. King David is nearing the end of his life. He is so sick, he is unable to keep his own body warm. And while he's sick and he's unable to leave his bed, his oldest living son, this guy named Adonijah, has decided, hey, it's time for me to become king. How many of you know the story of King Adonijah? <laughs> he wasn't a king. Yeah, gotcha. Um, <clears throat> So this is not a great move for Adonijah, okay? Adonijah is like doing this thing. It's kind of a, a mean thing. He's like, dad's going to die, so I'm going to become the king now, all right? But it's not a totally unexpected move, right? Right, at the time, he's the oldest living son of David. The king's about to die. We can't just have this kingdom in ridiculous turmoil. So he just kind of, you know, jumps the gun a little bit. The issue at hand is that David has vowed by God to his wife Bathsheba that Solomon is going to become king after the death of David. So in some sense, I feel like Adonijah is like kind of rightfully mad, you know, like everyone else in the world, it's the oldest living son who becomes king, and Adonijah is like, uh, uh, what, what's going on here? Um, and so I, you know, I feel bad for that. It, it theoretically should be his. Um, so Adonijah decides to throw himself a coronation party. He's like, you know what? I'm king. It's going to be great. Uh, whoever wants to come, come on over here. We'll have some chicken wings and pizza. and It'll be a great time. Um, and what's interesting is people show up. He's got about 50 military leaders. He's got priests. He's got people showing up to help him out. Uh, Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet learn about what's going on. And they're upset about it. And they know what David's promise is, that Solomon's going to be king. So they go to Solomon. They tell him what's going on. He's like, hey, Adonijah's trying to become king, but you made a promise. It's supposed to be Solomon. So here's what happens next in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 32 to 40. Everyone's favorite Palm Sunday text. Verse 32 of 1 Kings chapter 1 says, King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king, and the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, long live King Solomon. You shall then come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place. I have appointed him to become ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king, amen. Let the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king say so. And the Lord has been with the Lord my king, even so he may be with Solomon. 
Make his throne greater than the throne of the Lord, my King David. So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and the Churanthites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on the King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. There Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes, rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. And what we see in this passage here is David desires to make this kingly statement of Solomon public for all to see. And as we consider this triumphal entry narrative on this Palm Sunday, I think it would be wise for us to see the New Testament story through the eyes and the lens of the Old Testament narrative. Certainly as the Jews are in Jerusalem welcoming Jesus with their palm branches, this is the story that they have in mind. In their mind, they know exactly what they're doing. They're not just being like, oh, I wonder if this will get written in a Bible someday. Like, they're there being like, this is us welcoming the king. They know exactly what they're doing. As we move into this Holy Week where we seek to uh, treasure and glorify Jesus in our minds and in our hearts, um, and we spend time with these narratives of the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we learn that This story changes all things. Everything is changed. It doesn't change just our minds. It doesn't just change our hearts. It doesn't even just change who we are as people. The work of Jesus has changed the world. Ever since the moment where Jesus rose triumphantly from the grave, the world has been different. So we're going to examine how Jesus and his kingship, how the kingship of Jesus changes everything. Here's one thing that I like to tell people that not a lot of people like to hear, and that's okay because I have the microphone and you don't. Um, (laughs) I'm just kidding. Uh, It is easy for us as Christians to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, isn't it? Like we want a lot of things to be fixed, and we know when Jesus comes, he's going to do that. That's a good thing. Yet when we leave here on Sunday mornings, how often are we quick to hold on to our freedoms? How quickly are we to tout the benefits of things like um, our government or our democracy or get on social media and yell and make snide remarks to other people about God's image, about our own freedoms and rights, what we enjoy, and when other people or politicians have gone too far or not far enough? So I think we have this to consider. As human beings made in the image of God for God's glory, I believe we are a people made to be ruled. God created us and calls us as people to humble ourselves and submit everything to Jesus Christ as Lord and as King. He is in charge. He makes the rules. We live our lives as followers in total sold-out submission to Jesus and his word, not to our own desires, wants, or our own pleasures. I'm not saying that we should go out and think about lawmakers anything more than like who they are. Um, But what I am saying is that we have a desire to innately be our own kings or queens. We have this desire in ourselves where we love the idea of freedom or choosing leaders that represent our own values but not submitting to the one who is an ultimate authority. If Jesus is king as Solomon was king, it must change every single thing about our lives and the way we live. It simply must. If Jesus is king, it must change everything about our lives and the way we live. And these stories that we've read here so far this morning, they offer us three traits of true kingship. And as we look at these, we're going to see how there's really only one person who ought to be the ruler of our lives, and it is certainly not us. Trait number one, true kingship is given. True kingship is given. Many of you are familiar probably with the story of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table and the story of Excalibur and stuff like that. Uh, if you're not, it's this legend where this magical sword is uh, stuck, in a, uh, stuck in a stone or maybe sometimes comes out of water uh, and it's given to uh, whoever's going to be the true king of England. So it's given to Arthur Pendragon. He becomes the king of England. Um, and so other iterations of this tale, it's a little bit different. Um, and if all of that sounds weird to you, you're in good company because it is weird. Um, And so some of us, in a less holy way, are familiar with the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail. 
Yeah? Okay. So some of you might know where I'm going with this. Um, there is a really funny moment in that movie where he gets into an argument. The King Arthur gets into an argument about his authority with a peasant. Does anyone know what his name was? It's Dennis. Um, so he gets into this argument with Dennis, and so Arthur explains that I have received the angelic blessing from the Lady of the Lake, and that by divine providence, I, Arthur, should be king of the Britons. And Dennis responds indignantly by saying, listen, if strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government, supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. You can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery lady threw a sword at you. I mean, if I went around saying that I was an emperor just because some moistened girl had lobbed a scimitar at me, they'd put me away. I think that's awesome and really funny. And it's, it's you know, let's like, he's saying like, where do, like, really? That's where you get your authority from? But they both have kind of a point, right? Like if someone is given a divine sword and I'm not, I'm probably listening to him. I think that's fair. Uh, but on the other hand, is that really where authority comes from? But I do think there's this idea that's right and good and true, that true authority does not come from within. Right? We love this idea that we're the master of our own destiny, that we're in control, that we can grab life by the horns and kind of make of it what we unto. But, and I know that there are many people in this room who have been knocked around by life more than a few times. And they'll tell you there's very precious little in this life that we can control. Just because we're in control or declare that we're in control, that doesn't really make too much of a difference, does it? When we look at Adonijah in his passage in 1 Kings, we see him you know, declaring, I'm the king now, it's me, here's my party, it's going to be a great time. And it's not, like we said, it's not without good reason, but it doesn't do anything, right? He's still just Adonijah. He's got a few people on his side, but he's probably got some people who are hoping to ride his coattails of glory. And Adonijah is not being careless. He's forming strategic alliances, right? He's got a military leader on his side. He's got uh, Abiathar, the religious leader. He's got Joab, who is the commander of the armies. But this plan doesn't stand up. Even with his rights, quote unquote, as the oldest living son and having the right people in his corner, Adonijah's kingdom crumbles just as quickly as he tried to build it up. The public knowledge and claim by one authority, the authority of David, that Solomon is the king, that makes all the difference. Solomon never asked to be king. He never demands it. It is given to him. And because it is given and not claimed, we know him to be the true king of Israel, and God blesses Solomon as he makes Israel into a world power during the golden age of Israel of Solomon's reign. Back to Jesus, there are lots of authority figures at the time. We have Caesar who is declaring himself to be the divine ruler of the world. We have local governors who are acting as Roman authorities. Then we have local leaders of the Jewish people like Herod. Uh, even under them are religious leaders like the Pharisees, and even under them are people like the high priest like Caiaphas. But we, even with all of these authorities in place, Jesus knows himself to be the true king. So about 50 days after this story, 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus shares his final words on earth in a famous passage that we commonly know as the Great Commission. And it starts out in verse 18 of Matthew 28, and he says, Jesus came to them, the disciples who were still alive, and he says to them, all authority and heaven has been given to me. All authority. Not temporary authority, not authority for just this thing, not authority until I'm gone from heaven, not even authority, you know, beyond what Caesar has, all authority, everything, all of creation belongs to him. Our theology, as it's described in the Bible, teaches us in all of the cosmos, there is nothing outside of God's authority. Job chapter 41, verse 11, God says, who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. This God who created all things and rightfully claims all things for himself has given the same authority for all of those things to the God-man, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is in charge. We don't get to argue with that. That's why we pray, not my will, but yours be done. It's not on 
in heaven as I want it on earth, it's on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, who is both perfectly God and perfectly man, the only begotten Son of God not created, is endowed with all power and authority by God the Father. Jesus is King. That's it. We live in a time that a lot of theologians refer to as the already not yet. Means that Jesus has accomplished salvation, but he hasn't consummated the Um, salvation of us yet, that there's this time where Jesus has done the work, but sin is still in the world, and Jesus hasn't come back to live as king on earth forever yet, the already not yet. But here's a glimpse into what the kingdom of Jesus looks like. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the kind of authority that our King has. This is not calm Jesus anymore. This is not Jesus holding a baby lamb, right? This is not Jesus bouncing a toddler on his knee. This is righteous King Jesus showing up with his throne with fire in his eyes, with a sword coming out, with a tattoo right here, with his name, right? That's not That's not just our king as followers. That's not just our king. That is the king. That's the only one. That's Jesus. And on that day, no one else's authority on this earth will compare. They will melt like wax before King Jesus. This is the authority given to Jesus as king. It is his. It is no one else's. We don't get to claim that authority. We don't get to drop in as sub-kings or temporary takeovers. Authority is not given to us. We are given a place in Jesus' kingdom as co-heirs. Praise God. Absolutely. But he is king. We are the servants. So as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, he knows authority is given to him, and he is the true king. True kingship is given. Trait number two, true kingship is humble. True kingship is humble. Humility is kind of a tricky thing to learn. It's kind of even tricky uh, to define. It almost seems like the more you pursue humility, the less likely you are to achieve it, right? Because you're always thinking about it. Uh, We all know that joke about someone being like, oh, look how humble I am, you know. Uh, We all love that joke. Humility is a trait that doesn't get a lot of praise, I think, in today's culture, right? Like politicians love to brag about their accomplishments. Entertainers, performers, athletes are always promoting themselves and they're trying to stay in the spotlight. Uh, Even if you think about the time that you spend online, like social media is all driven about like self-promotion, isn't it? Even if you're not like a, like a celebrity or anything, it's always about like, look how awesome this person's vacation is. How, how cute this baby is. Look how well-behaved these children are. Look how sweet this person's shoes or their car. Like it's all about self-promotion and growing your own image over and over like that. It's like the world that we live in right now thrives on the opposite of humility. But that's not the way that God desires his people to behave. I've been given two good definitions of humility over the years I want to share with you. The first one is humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but it is thinking of yourself less. I find that to be helpful. Another one that's very good that's been given to me, humility is thinking about yourself the way God thinks about you. As we read chapter 1 of 1 Kings, never once does Solomon go to bat for himself. Never once. In fact, he doesn't say anything in this whole passage until he's already king. And the only thing he says is that he forgives Adonijah. 
right? We don't want to assume anything here. This is not, we're not trying to draw an argument from silence necessarily, but I think it speaks to Solomon at some level that he probably heard about what is happening and he didn't do anything about it. Solomon may have just known he is under God's promise. He is the son of David, the rightful heir to the king of Israel. Solomon would have been well-versed in the Torah, which um, we know is the first five books of the Old Testament. And so it makes me wonder if he hears all this stuff that's going on and he remembers the, the words of God in Exodus 14:14 14, 14, when he says, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Church, how would your life be different if you trusted God to win your battles for you? How would things be different if you trusted God to have the last word instead of you? How would your marriage be different if you didn't need to get even and trusted God to work on your spouse's issues so you didn't have to? How would your work look if you weren't being so passive-aggressive to your coworkers? How would your parenting look if you you were just doing your best and you gave your kids attitudes, uh, faith, and their behavior over to God? Students, how would your life be different if you did your best and trusted the outcome to what God was going to do. That's what humility lived out is like. It's to say about ourselves, I know I can't do this. I don't know what's best. I'm not in control, but God, you are. This self-forgetfulness puts God in charge of our lives. It put him in his proper place in our lives where he should be. And Solomon, the future king of Israel, humbled himself enough to trust the king of kings with the outcome of a potential catastrophe. So as we turn our attention to Jesus, we see him similarly riding a donkey into the gates of Jerusalem, this prophecy fulfillment from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, where he says, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. We saw that one day, we just saw this earlier, right? We see that one day Jesus is coming back on a war horse. We know that's happening one day. And on that day, the time will humility for humility will have passed. And everyone will know Jesus is Lord. He will judge the faithful and the faithless. But on this day, in this time, in this story, Jesus' mouth is closed. He rides not on a war horse, but a donkey. He fulfills ancient prophecy rather than keeping some earthly passing promise. He symbolizes a king coming to make peace with his people instead of war. The humility embodied by Jesus is a hallmark of his kingship, and therefore it is a hallmark of his kingdom. In the book of Romans, Paul writes, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what is this peace? It is first and foremost peace with God. The fact is we are all sinners. By nature and by choice, we have rebelled knowingly and unknowingly against the Almighty God. And because of that, we are by definition His enemies. So God would be completely justified to destroy us as sinners. In our sinners, we have sinned against an eternal God, which means our sin is an eternal sin, which means that the punishment for an eternal sin must be an eternal punishment. But praise God, he did not allow us to remain in and wallow in sin. He sent by his grace and loving kindness, his son Jesus Christ, God made flesh, the promises of the Lord with skin on, and this humble Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not live. He died on the cross, a brutal death that we as sinners should have died, and was raised from the grave gloriously on the third day to show God is eternally victory over death, and for all those who are trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, that forgiveness is yours as well. Paul sums this all up in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, and he says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
The fancy word for Jesus coming to earth is condescension, and his putting on humanity is called his incarnation. But do you know what it's called in theological books? This is a real thing. What it's called for the Son of God to give up the praises and glories of heaven to be born as a man? It is called the humiliation of Christ. Because of Jesus' humility embodied in this moment, in his riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, even as a glorious king, we are welcomed into his family. We have peace with God. We are not only accepted into God's kingdom, we are welcomed into God's kingdom. Friends with God, co-heirs with Christ is what the Bible says. True kingship is not self-aggrandizing. It does not make much of itself. It isn't proud. It isn't boastful. True kingship does whatever it takes to do what is right. True kingship is humble. And trait number three, true kingship is exclusive. True kingship is exclusive. One of my favorite hobbies is getting into competitions with people on who has had more jobs. I usually win, which is why I like it so much. Um, there are a couple of jobs, I've had this conversation with my wife a few times, that I'm not sure count, and so I don't typically uh, count those. Um, but, so I'm 31 years old, who wants to take a stab at how many jobs Pastor Eric has had, including this one? Uh, 17, I hear 17, 17, 17, 17. Uh, I'll just tell you, it's 22. Hey, great job. Uh, yes, I've had 22 jobs. I started working when I was 15. Uh, legally started working when I was 15. That's a different story. Um, so I've had 22 jobs. Um, this is like the third or fourth job I had. This is the summer of 2009 between my freshman and sophomore year of college. I worked at a country club uh, near Baltimore. I worked in like the snack hut near the pool. Um, I cannot predict how my life is going to turn out, but I can pretty much guarantee that's the last time I'll ever go to a country club. <laughs> that's not like... <laughs> if you're not familiar with what a country club is or you're not sure what they're for, same. Um, here's what I can tell you about this particular club. The people who were members there really liked golf and had a lot of money. This is in 2009, so not counting for inflation. At the time, the dues for membership were $55,000 a year. Right? <laughs> Dang. Here's the thing. So for that money, what are they getting, right? You'd expect like, oh, you get to meet like Snoop Dogg every night or something. I don't know. Uh, but here's what they're getting. They're getting good food. They're getting valet parking. They're getting access to other people with similar statuses in the community. And they're getting that sweet golf course. Um, now, if some random person, like, I don't know, uh, me, uh, was there and just started to try, like, enjoying all the benefits of the country club, they would probably be rightfully mad, right? Like, okay, this dude is supposed to be giving me hot dogs, not playing golf on my golf course, or, like, going for joy rides in my Mercedes or something like that. Um, so I'm going to bring this down to another area that kind of makes more sense to us. Uh, maybe you're a Costco member, or a Sam's Club member, you're a member to Amazon Prime, woo, Prime customer, uh, right? You, play go you pay good money for that exclusive access, right? Like, you get benefits that other people don't get. Wouldn't it be ridiculous if you paid and I didn't, but we got the same stuff? Like, you're paying for that free two-day shipping. I'm not, but I still get the free two-day shipping. That would kind of make you mad, wouldn't it? You'd be like, well, what the heck am I paying for? This is ridiculous. I think... In that sense, exclusivity is good, right? It is right, it is normal for things to be exclusive. And so I have this, I, this thought, and I'm sure I stole it from someone, that I think Christianity is uniquely exclusive and non-exclusive at the same time. It is not exclusive in that every single person, past, present, and future in the whole world is invited and welcomed to trust in Jesus. It is exclusive in that forgiveness is found only in Jesus. 
So kingship, too, is something that is inherently exclusive, right? There can't be two kings, just like we don't have two presidents, praise God. Uh, Your company doesn't have multiple CEOs. Sports teams have one head coach or manager. Leadership should be exclusive. David recognized this. As he's on his deathbed, you could have just been like, guys, they tell him like, hey, Adonijah wants to be king, but Solomon's supposed to be king. And David could have just been like, guys, I'm cold. I'm dying peace. I don't know. Like, he could have just, like, gone out on that, but David, seeking to be faithful, he makes this hard call that Solomon is still the son to receive the promise and blessing of God. And as Solomon is paraded through town, the cheers of the people of Jerusalem drown out the little Adonijah party, and Adonijah recognizes, well, I can't be the other king, which means I can't be the king, so I'm out. Kingship in Israel was exclusively David's to give, and he gave it exclusively to Solomon. And this happens in Jesus' story too. Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Herod, the Pharisees, all phonies. There is one king, and it is Jesus. Now, we know Solomon was imperfect in his kingship, but he, um, he, he started out well, but he lost his way. He... Um, He was wildly unfaithful as a husband and a father. His rule led to the splitting of the kingdom of Israel. He led his country into idolatry. Ultimately, Solomon was a man who sinned and died. Jesus never sinned, and he never will. Jesus did die once, but he did not stay dead, and he will never die again. He has laid claim as the exclusive king of all creation. He sits on the throne now in heaven, and even in this moment, creatures are bowing down before him saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Jesus is Savior, and Jesus alone. In the Reformed Christian tradition, which, um, you know, at this church we would be calling ourselves like descendants of the Protestant Reformation, uh, there are five, what are called the five sola. Is anyone familiar with these, the five sola? Um, Quick theology lesson for you. These are the five exclusives of Protestant faith. Sola scriptura, scripture alone is our authority. Sola fide, we are saved by faith alone. Sola gratia, we are saved by God's grace alone. Sola Christus, we are saved by the work of Christ alone. And sola deo gloria, we are saved for the glory of God alone. These alones are beautiful, glorious, and objectively true. And Jesus as king is beautiful, glorious, and objectively true. Whether he's humbly walking into Jerusalem on a donkey or coming in power at the end of all things, he alone is God. He alone is king. If he alone is king, then his kingship means that we are not kings. We are not masters of our own destiny. We are not in control of our own fate. We are limited, and so we must trust ourselves and commit our faith to the one who is exclusively in control of all things. Kingship is indeed exclusive, and Jesus is exclusively king. In J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, the country of Gondor has a king who is alive but not present, and so the country is kind of run by a steward uh, who sits on the throne in the king's stead. He is a man named Denethor. Denethor refuses to give up his throne. He becomes corrupt in his desire for power and comfort. He doesn't lead his people. He ends up only caring uh, for himself and is uninterested in allowing the king to return to his rightful place. Denethor eventually meets his demise, and the true king Aragorn assumes the throne. Aragorn does not seize the throne, but he's given as it is rightfully his. He is a humble servant, and throughout the trilogy, he is laying down his life to serve and care for the whole world of Middle-earth. Aragorn recognizes that as the only king, he has responsibilities and must assume his throne to fight off evil. Jesus is the true king. He is the only one who ever has and ever will be king. He will assume his throne because it is his, and he will fight evil for us. He is given the title. He is humble. He is exclusively king. If you are not a follower of Jesus, consider this right now, right here, today, your your invitation 
to make Jesus your king. You're welcome to come up and talk to me or one of the elders or pastors afterwards. We would love to talk to you about what it means to make Jesus the king of your life. Holy Week is here. Let this be the week where you allow Jesus' kingship to change everything. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for who you are, for how you've worked in our lives, and that you are king. May we rest in the good, glorious, and lovely truth that we don't have to be king because you are. I pray that we would live our lives today, this week, and forever knowing that you are the good and true king. God, we love you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, stand with me and let me dismiss you with this benediction from Romans chapter 15. I invite you to hold your hands out with your palms up and receive this in a spirit of worship and submission to God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Church, go rejoicing in the kingship of God this week. You're dismissed.